been working there now for the last 20 years. I was born there in 1965, so I think that makes me um, a, a solid uh, 55 years old. Um, I worked there with my brother and my father and my niece. Um, my wife, Ricky, and I both grew up in the Moraga Ward. And while we met in uh, primary, I like <laughs> to say that we didn't kiss until we were CTRs. But the reality is that she actually wasn't even aware of who I was until we were in college and she finally figured out that I had a mortal crush on her. Um, so we were both at Stanford from 1984 to 1989. And I finally won her over and we were married in 1991. I'm the youngest of five boys uh, pictured here. Um, and I think one of them's tuned on, so I gotta be careful what I say. Um, and my parents, though descendants of pioneers, I would say adhered less to the tenets of their faith in the early years of their marriage than, than I would later choose, and less so than they do today. And owing to lots of different forces in their lives, they were not too involved in the church during the early years of their marriage, but, um, but they had all their older sons baptized in their late teens. Um, and then, when, and, uh, then later on, I was baptized. So when I turned eight, I, I was baptized, joined the church. And despite, uh, I'd say I have an older brother who's a de self-declared agnostic, and I have a brother who's an atheist, a brother who's um, a born-again Christian, a brother who's, um, in a, his wife's Jewish, and the children have been bat mitzvahed. Um, that's kind of the, the background I grew up with. But the teachings of Christ and the church seem to resonate with me with my core. For example, though, I, I thought I, I think I used some cuss words as a youngster uh, while playing golf. Here's a picture of uh, my golf at an early age. I don't think I was cussing in this picture. Um, but by the age of 10, I can vividly remember reverencing the name of God and declaring to myself that I would never use the Lord's name in vain. And so a good missed ball today on a golf course will get a little bit of private profanity out of me, uh, but I don't think I've ever taken the uh, God's name in vain. And I think that comes not from primary, but from some inner reverence. Uh, and um, so I'm, I'm grateful for that. I was also blessed later on with some really thoughtful youth leaders. My scoutmaster, Bob Fuller, pictured next to my father and his wife, not my dad's wife, but Bob Fuller's wife, um, who continually told me, He'd say, Andy, you have to come to grips with the Book of Mormon. And have you read it? And while I had not during my teenage years, I later, um, just this last year, spoke at Bob's funeral. Um, and I shared with him before he died that, yes, I had gained a personal witness of its truthfulness and that his testimony added fuel to my own. P.S. He's also one that taught me to swear. Um, but that's, I'll hold that story for later on. So at age 17... Um, I guess I thought I was kind of hot stuff, getting good grades in high school. Um, and at that point, God placed into my life uh, a real spiritual giant, one of the smartest people I know. Um, and his uh, life motto remains, never mind, he'd say, never mind my obligations. Tell me what the Lord wants me to do, and I'll do it. And, um, you know, that's, that was a great influence to me, to have someone who I really admired, uh, great intellect, um, seeing God's uh, hand in his life and w showing me uh, the ways to recognize that myself. And finally, by, by way of introduction, I'll note that as a freshman in college, God further signals his interest in my life by engineering a set of friendships that, I, that have lasted to this day. Um, the only 10 Mormons in our Stanford class of 1600. Um, and I'd say 30 years later, we're all really quite committed to the modern Church of Christ. I marvel that this group of thoughtful, educated men and women find in their lives uh, the way forward uh, in faith, despite questions common to our contemporary time. Which brings me to the first vision. So the way I approached this was, uh, I thought, um, I'm just going to, the, the topic immediately interested me. And I thought, well, I'm going to write down the first things that come to my mind. Um, I'm just going to sit down and do a, do a little brainstorm and whatever 10 things I, I write down, that's going to be, I just wanted to see what those things were. And so for this evening's discussion, I'm going to give you the unfiltered look at my first 10 um, thoughts about uh, when I self prompted myself with the loaded words, uh, three words, the first vision. And as I prevent, present my thoughts, I'll be looking over uh, maybe on the chat bar to see if there's any questions that arise. 
And if I can answer those, I'll try to do my best to do so. So that's the game plan. So here we, here we go. Um, the first one that I wrote down is that I can't forget the early and powerful sentiments I had about the first vision when I was a missionary and how even years later, these feelings are quickly resurfaced. So deciding to serve a mission was a tough sell. My brothers um, didn't, didn't approve of it. Uh, neither did my classmates from Stanford who could not understand why I would leave my pre-med courses and you know, for such an endeavor. And other detractors also offered their, their, their resistance to the idea. And my, I'd say my parents weren't so sure either, uh, but they did support my choice. Nevertheless, I, I couldn't shake the notion that I could serve, that, um, that I should serve, and eventually that I would serve. I had finally finished reading the, and studying the Book of Mormon for the first time at age 19. And I was, uh, I hope my seminary students aren't listening right now, because uh, that, that would just, that would really be bad news for that to get out. But age 19, and I was convinced at that point of its truthfulness. And so in 1984, just six years um, after Spencer Kimball's revelation furthered racial equality in the church and overturned what I have since concluded was a, a mistaken church policy about priesthood, I entered the MTC and headed to the Spanish-speaking Texas-Mexico uh, border. Um, but while I was in the MTC, I began to realize that I had not thought deeply or with much intent about the life and actions of Joseph Smith. And frankly, I knew very little about him. And these questions I had never consider, considered surfaced. Did he really see God the Father in Christ? Was he a modern prophet? Was he relating the truth about his experience? And so I pieced together what I could find, um, the account of Joseph and the Pearl of Great Price, some of the other articles I had. Um, I had a lot of anti-Mormon literature that it, one of my uh, brothers had sent me. Um, and I entered into this period of crisis and resolution. Um, so this is my journal here. I kept a journal and I wrote, no, you can't read my handwriting, but I'll, I'll read it to you. I wrote in that right there. I said, all day today, um, I have had a feeling that is worse than I've ever had. For the first time, I've questioned all that I believe. I've had the worst spirit with me today. It stems from doubt that has been arising as I read the Book of Mormon and doubts about the Trinity, the witnessing of the spirit. I've felt empty all day. I may not have a good, I may not have a personal witness of the Book of Mormon, but I can't yet deny it. I'm searching hard. And so for about a week, um, uh, I was in real turmoil. And I, I knew that if I did not feel a conviction born of the spirit, that I would just go back to school because that would have been easier anyway. And what I'll never forget is that, and I'll never be able to deny is what happened about a week later. And my journal reads, uh, I recorded the following. I just got back from a testimony meeting. Wow. I feel like a miracle has occurred in my life. My feelings have been deciphered. At least six people got up and said word for word what I had been feeling. And then my companion, Brian, got up and said, we don't get a testimony, we develop one. I was flooded at that point with the feelings of the Holy Ghost peace and understanding, calm, joy, confidence, optimism. It entered into my physical being and affected a change that I've never forgotten. And, and as we sang, oh, how lovely was the morning. I was near tears with the witness of the truth. It's as though God was saying to me, Andy, thanks for asking. What you're praying about actually happened. It may not be word for word, but Joseph was the prophet of the restoration. Now go about your work serve as a missionary and have a nice day. And, and that was it. And it was like God had sent me a message, a message for me that went to every fiber of my being. And why not? Um, was I not as important to God as a young farm boy from New York? Did I not matter equally to God? I thought that God cared. And so I took, I, I took it for what it was and placed that brick in my foundation layer of belief. I've certainly added to that experience but it's always seemed to me greedy and narrow to re-ask God, hey, can you tell me again about that thing you already told me about? Did Joseph really experience what he said? So it's kind of like Gideon asking uh, God for more than one sign uh, with the dew on the wool fleece from this old uh, picture here from the 1500s. You know, you get, he's told me once, I, I, didn't, I don't need to be told 
multiple times, um, he had sent me the message powerfully and directly. And so while I pray often for a strengthening of my faith, I don't find myself often saying, did Joseph really experience the first vision as you reported? Because I've already been told that the answer is yes. That's number one. So number two is that the first vision um, is not the first vision. I thought that's kind of a clever comment. Let me fix this because I think you can't see it there. It's not the first vision. It's just another vision. And perhaps a better term would be another vision, and this time to a farm boy in New York. In fact, the first vision has a more contemporary origin, the term the first vision. Joseph Smith certainly never referred to his theophany as the first vision. He didn't refer to it much at all, according to historians, until he first penned an account 10 years later. Really, the message of the appearance of the Godhead to a young boy in New York in the early days of the U.S. experiment was, it's time to restore the church to the earth, to restore the priesthood, to begin a dialogue that won't be disrupted by kings and autocracies and revolution. Now is the time. That's kind of what I think the first vision message is, which lessens the importance of Joseph's role in the first vision and also helps me to understand the differences in the nine recorded first and second hand accounts of the first vision. Joseph was just another in a long line of men and women who declared their role in God's relationship with mankind and womankind. And it has always made sense to me that the timing of the restoration had little to do with Joseph and everything to do with the arc of history. The privileged position of the embryonic United States with its stated tolerance of religious experience and the need to restore priesthood powers to the earth, along with the messy process of revelation that would ensue. Opening up the heavens to initiate this process required a servant, and so why not Joseph? One of the early scriptures I learned that supports this view of a utilitarian prophet is Amos 1.8, which states, Surely the Lord God will do nothing but he revealed his words unto his servants, the prophets. He doesn't say awesome prophets or perfect prophets or prophets who are better than you prophets. It's just that Elohim and Jehovah like that mentoring model of having, prophet, uh, of having prophets. And that's always made me, um, it's always made sense to me. And so recognizing the vision of Joseph as just another in a long line of communication affirms my faith. Let's see, the third one, see where I am here on my slideshow here. All right, here we go. Here's a third one. This one surprised me, but I've come to understand that Joseph had amazing parents who supported him and believed him. I guess I was surprised when I read over my list that, that this point of parental allegiance was part of my um, first vision brainstorm. In fact, it was the third thing I wrote down. Perhaps it's because I have children of my own that I realize how hard it is for a parent to follow a child but Joseph Smith Sr. and Lucy Mack Smith heard what their son told them and changed the course of their lives forever. Think of the power of that testimonial. Two parents, as well as the rest of the family, who knew of Joseph's strengths, his weaknesses, um, and his yearnings, hearing their young boy, who was obviously more mature than I was at age 14, when Joseph tells his parents that he saw God the Father in Christ, that his prayer about which church to join had been answered. They believe him because they know him. I just think he must have had really terrific parents. My fourth one that I wrote down um, comes from my, a uh, little inspired by my seminary experience. Here's my uh, uh, the reenactment of the uh, Last Supper in seminary. Um, but it's this number four, which is that studying church history as a seminary teacher, surprisingly emphasized to me the profound humanity of Joseph Smith and his desire to be instrumental in serving God. So despite my conviction that Joseph was a modern prophet, as I said, I admittedly had not studied his life in great depth prior to 2018. Um, and and uh, at that point, I'd read about him as a missionary and I'd studied the teachings of the prophet Joseph Smith, which was published in 2017. I'm sorry, 2007, I'd read Rough Stone Rolling by Richard Bushman, also from 2007, and perhaps my favorite book, uh, which was uh, also by Richard Bushman, On the Road with Joseph Smith, where there recounts his year-long reflections about his seminal book and how it morphed his faith. 
However, despite these studies, I have never truly or and seriously put the context of Joseph Smith's life into the early history of the church. How did they fit together? Why did people follow him? What, what decisions were made by the many individuals who converted only after a day of being with the Book of Mormon? So when I taught church history and the Doctrine and Covenants to the Moraga Ward Seminary two years ago, I was a bit apprehensive about what my journey through church history would uncover. What became clear very early on to me was that Joseph Smith was a normal young man growing up in a normal agrarian community in the early years of a new nation. He was a hard worker. He came from a poor family and as did so many, he was devoted to his friends. And early on, he fell in love with Emma in his young twenties. He never amounted to much in terms of personal possessions. He also did not waver in his message about a living God. One obvious discovery for me was that, uh, is that while Joseph was always learning, he had periods of many revelations, but also periods where he felt that God had deserted him. On several occasions, the pathway to the heavens and God's will seemed shut down. And during a critical period when the membership of the church was wavering between Liberty and Far West and, and Nauvoo, I'd seen that Joseph was kind of on his own, receiving no word from God. As I reviewed and studied these periods of, of his life's history, it became clear to me that Joseph was not too dissimilar to other people I know, Bishop Logan, Sister Reigns, Janda Reigns, Maurizio Torres. I could also see similarities between Joseph and Sue Severson or Ian McBride or Michaela Erickson or Spencer Larson or Cindy Tyker. All of these people I know, and they're wonderful people, and they must certainly have their ups and downs, their personal strengths, as well as their blind spots. And the more I became aware of Joseph's spiritual journey, the more I could embrace him as a prophet. By his very flawed mortal life, I could see God teaching all of us that we are no different. We can seek and receive guidance from God. We can seek and receive guidance about our families and about our personal circumstances. We, like Joseph, are expected to figure most things out on our own, as that gives us the commitment and the buy-in we need to move forward. Just like God won't make me do anything, I also observed that God could not force Joseph's hand, but that he worked with the prophet he had to bring forth the early moments of the restoration. I also observed that Joseph, like me and all of us, made mistakes. He seemed impulsive at times, excommunicating people and then rebaptizing them the same day, which kind of makes me laugh. I mean, I think it would have been kind of a fun to see W.W. W. Phelps uh, keep going and coming and going and coming. Some of his ideas seemed ill-fated, such as the Kirtland Bank or, or Zion Camp. But as with us, even his ill-fated efforts were used by God for, for good. What a great lesson. Even Joseph Smith's obvious imperfections were no obstacle for God's magnificent plan for our growth and happiness. So my year with Joseph Smith and the Moraga Ward Seminary strengthened my faith in his calling and in his role. I'm thankful for the insights I received that year and for the way my Heavenly Father has seen fit to add to his initial message to me, Andy, thank you for asking. What you're praying about actually happened. It may not be word for word, but Joseph was the prophet of the restoration. Now go about your work, serve as a seminary teacher, and have a nice day. So my fifth thought here, again, on this uh, unedited flow of ideas, was that Joseph experienced episodes of depression surrounding the events of the first vision and later in his life. This may seem a small point, but depression is something I've personally confronted at various times in my life. And I'm also aware it's a pressure, it's a pressing issue for many members of the church. So when I encounter scriptural examples of revered leaders who seem to be in the grips of either a profound trial or something more akin to major depression, I have taken note. I recall Job and Paul, Alma, Peter, even Christ writing of deep, emotionally profound and discouraging times. In Joseph's 1832 account of his early life, he writes, my mind became exceedingly distressed. And he uses language such as being ready to sink into despair and abandon himself into utter destruction. Such frank language further allows me to understand who this man was and why he pleaded with God in ways that I also have done. 
his role as a young man uh, trying to move um, his life forward became familiar to me and his theophany, though magnitudes different from my own experiences with divinity, seems like an honest response from a God who both wanted to answer a simple prayer, but also had other agenda items that this boy would oversee. While it's true some people have seemed to glide through life while seeming, with seeming little effort, surely that person is a minority. We worship the Savior and emulate him as best we can because he truly was the perfect being. For the rest of us, including Joseph, the road is often more rocky. Here's my forgiving missteps visual cue, <laughs> which is the Kirtland Bake note. Um, and here's, I, I, I wanna mention this number six is that forgiving him uh, of, of these missteps, paradoxically for me, strengthened my testimony that he was a prophet. I imagine an effort to present a gussied up view of any leader, follow, followers look to the good. So we see videos of presidential and congressional candidates that have nice music and positive themes. We see airbrush photos and paintings. Uh, Michelangelo's David surely shows a perfected human. Movie stars look their best. Truths just the same are the self-recorded stories of Peter's life and Paul's conversion or any of the self-congratulatory writings um, uh, of other scriptorians. Certainly Nephi was a bit high on himself. Um, but such biographical improvements are natural and expected. And that's why we all know the good stories of our parents' lives, but none of the really bad ones. So getting back to Joseph, when I learned about his foibles and missteps, I can either A, conclude that he was not a prophet and reject him, or B, recognize his humanity and look at the balance of his efforts to see the directing hand of God. And for me, when I was able to become familiar with the many second person descriptions of Joseph's life and able to consider the decisions he had to make as the church membership was growing and able to read about the complexities of the decisions he was making, when I was able to, to consider the intense hatred the early church members faced as they moved into liberty and independence and even Nauvoo, it just became clear to me that Joseph had about as much divine guidance as did Moses, who was stuck outside of the promised land for decades, allegedly because his faith had faltered, or just about as much contact, divine contact as Peter, who in the moment of, dis, of decision denied the Savior three times in one evening. In the balance, I observed Joseph's decades of service to God, to the early church, and the welfare of the saints to be genuine and what I would expect from a striving Christian man. And when I read about Joseph's decisions that I know are going to end up badly for him or for the others or for the saints, I reflect on Carolyn Pearson's sentiment when she says uh, uh, that Joseph sometimes is like a Shakespearean uh, tragedy. And she, she wants to say, oh, brother Joseph, don't do this. Don't do this next thing you're, I know you're gonna do. That's kind of how I feel. And I admire him more for his humanity. For my faith, it's the very human nature of Joseph revealed in his highly chronicled life that testifies of his prophetic role. He did so many amazing things and commanded so much power from heaven in miraculous manners that the missteps allow me to see him as a person and to redirect the adulation back to Jehovah, back to Elohim, and back to the Holy Spirit. All right, this one might surprise you, uh, but I keep bees, and so... Uh, when I, <laughs> well, I hope I'm going to mute this here. I don't know if it's playing. I don't want the volume on this, but I'm a beekeeper of sorts. A little bit odd, but one of the first 10 things that came to my mind, it's true, these bees that I've kept since 2004, it's an odd hobby because I'm allergic to bee stings. So when I'm with the bees trying to clean up or tend, uh, tend to it, I get a little freaked out. So I get my bee suit on, I tape up the openings, and so the bees can't get in, I go to work. It's always best to be calm, otherwise the bees sense your anxiety, and they get a little, uh, they get a little animated too when, when you're anxious. So um, I always have to sing a song, and I always end up singing, Oh, how lovely was the morning, radiant beam the sun above. Bees were humming, sweet birds singing, music ringing through the grove. So that's it. So I guess, I guess somehow I'm hoping that there's like some LDS bees in there that know I'm not trying to hurt them 
or just hoping that they'll leave me alone. Uh, don't they know that the Jaredites brought bees with them or that the Utah pioneers kept bees? I don't know. Uh, maybe I should be singing something like smoke gets in your eyes. Uh, but up to now I'm sticking with uh, my version of the first vision. So just a habit. Uh, and it's one of the 10 things that came to my mind when I wrote it. Number eight, almost wrapping up here. I see no secondary gain to Joseph Smith not being entirely truthful about his early life's experience in the sacred grove. I just don't see it. I don't, I don't like to approach my faith um, from a perspective of why not, uh, or by summoning proofs or justifications for a belief. For example, I've never been moved by the archeology span or the geography of the Book of Mormon, or for that matter, by invoking the literary complexity of the Book of Mormon as a way to support its divinity. But as I read, I hope you can't hear the police coming for me here. I that, hope that's not too loud. Um, let's see, that's, uh, let's see, it's gonna go by here, there we go. Um, at any rate, that's, uh, that's just never really moved me too much. But as I read about and studied in depth uh, the life of Joseph Smith during recent years in the context of what I have come to know and in light of the criticisms and attacks, I was simply overcome with the conclusion that Joseph was telling the truth. 12 years ago, or 12 years after the spiritual experience that changed the course of his life, and at the age of only 26 or 27, he penned this line, which is, this is taken from his, his handwritten notes. Um, I was filled with the spirit of God and the Lord opened the heavens upon me and I saw the Lord and he spake unto me saying, Joseph, my son, thy sins are forgiven thee. Go thy way, walk in my statutes and keep my commandments. In the 25 years um, that I've been working with the young men and the young women of the church and professionally, Perhaps I've had friendships with several hundred youth. And I think I've seen all kinds of people develop from age 12 to 30. I've seen kids on drugs and in jail. I've seen mechanics and medics. I've seen firemen and foremen. I certainly don't consider myself an expert and I'm not trained in psychology, but I can say this, young people do not embrace lies. And if they do, the lie cannot persist. Their true character emerges a young person yearns for authenticity and for integrity, and their walk with God is always unique and paced in a particular way that's particular to them. In this context, I can state that the more I read about Joseph Smith, I feel like I understand what he was trying to do. I recognize in him the yearnings of an unusually mature boy, one who possessed an internal reverence and who was reflective. He enjoyed company, he was playful, he loved his family. He sincerely um, wanted the best for those around him. I've seen this boy before, and I've seen this girl before, people with these abilities. And when I put his life in the context of my life's experiences, it's just plainly clear to me that Joseph Smith was forthright, truthful, and honest. At least that's how he seems to me. And at age 33, he would write the more familiar declaration, quote, for I had seen a vision. I knew it, and I knew that God knew it, and I could not deny it. Neither dared I do it. At least I knew that by so doing, I would offend God and come under condemnation. All right, my last two here. These that look terrible here with my slides. Let me see if I can make that look a little bit better. Um, that fits better there. Um, Number nine and 10, I'm just gonna read these together because they, they, kind of, they kind of go together. Number nine is a modern prophet does not have any more claim on personal revelation than I do in my realm. And my relationship with God is what's important for me, not someone else's relationship with God. And then the last thing I wrote down was that we get too much into prophet worship in the church. That as I've been able to really appreciate the life of Joseph Smith and learn about what he endured, I really have come to admire him. I'll state again that I read these to you in the order that, uh, that I wrote them down. I didn't try to organize them in a particular way. So as I review the list, I'm struck with two themes. First, my overwhelming impression is that Joseph Smith was a prophet of God and that visions occurred and Joseph was the instrument of the restoration of the modern church. And second, that Heavenly Father does not want us to idolize or worship a prophet. That type of reverence should be reserved for the Lord Jesus Christ and for our Heavenly Father. 
In some ways, I think Joseph must have known that. It freed him to be himself, while those around him, uh, while those around him expected at times too much. He was at first a boy, and then a young man, and then a man, but he was always a child of God, which is true for all of us. A few years ago, I told my seminary class that Joseph Smith's first vision was um, was important, but more important um, was uh, was what your first vision is. When we when have you felt the influence of God in your life? Have you written it down? Have you recorded your brush with Heavenly Father, with Heavenly Mother, with Christ, with the Spirit? Are there five other people who can relate what you told them about God? Are there nine accounts of your experiences with deity? That's what I take from the first vision. I have not seen God, but I have seen his undeniable hand in the lives of so many people, including in my own family and in my own life, that I know it and I know that God knows it, and I cannot deny it. Joseph's theophany changed his life, and my personal experiences with the Spirit have powerfully changed my life. I pray for the conviction and the courage to stay true and to be an agent for goodness in the world. And I think that's what Joseph was hoping would result from his honesty in relating his first vision of the heavens. And I share that with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. So I'm, I'm happy to take uh, any questions. I don't know if there are any. Um, uh, I see one. So I'm, I'll, I'll just answer questions for three minutes. How's that? So uh, from one sister watching is, uh, uh, that Heavenly Mother was not mentioned in the first vision. And that's, that is true by the, according to the writings that we have. And, um, and this uh, sister also comments that she believes that she was there. And I think that certainly makes sense. And it's, what's interesting to me in that regard is that, and I, this is one of my thoughts, this may be number 11, was that Joseph didn't know what he was seeing when he saw the, when he had this vision. I don't think he knew what it was. It's pretty clear that as a young person, that was, that was new territory which is one of the reasons his accounts change uh, over time, I think, is that he's reflecting on it with different, with different wisdom. So, um, but yeah, we, we'll, we'll, we'll certainly learn more when we get further accounts, I would think. Brother Davis, I'll, I'll turn it back to you. I don't see any other questions showing up. And I wanna thank you all for your, for your time and, and for listening. I hope, hope uh, the audio came through and, and uh, that you learned something interesting. And the audio, the audio was great. We, we were able to hear the sirens in the back too. So, um, but the audio was fabulous. Uh, thank you for your insights and, uh, and your thought provoking um, uh, insights into the gospel and the first vision. Um, it does make me want to become a seminary student of yours. Although they tell me I'm too old for that. Um, we have, we have a zoom seminary in the fall, so you can, you can anyone can join great <laughs> well, cuz i may i may just do that yeah. Yeah. um thanks thank you all for attending here this evening <clears throat> and um and just to make a, a plug for future um sessions our next one is eric jepson on july 26th and um and we we'll look forward to his insights and um as well um if we could close with a prayer um chuck if you can just unmute yourself and uh, and we'll go from there i am unmuted Right. Okay. Our Father in heaven, we approach to you at the conclusion of this fireside on the first vision. We're grateful for the time we have spent. We're grateful for the wonderful preparation and presentation that uh, Brother Sorensen has done tonight. This difficult time of pandemic. We pray for thy spirit to bless us with a peaceful confidence that we might continue on as best we can and as safely as we can. We pray for thy spirit to 
help us know how we can still serve and minister to those in the church and as our neighbors and friends outside of the church. There's still much that we can do. Again, we thank thee for this spiritual occasion this evening and say these things in the name of thy son, Jesus Christ. Amen.